Okay, thank you everybody for coming. Um, it's great to see so many of you here tonight. Um, and I'm sure we'll have a few more come in, but um, I'm just going to kick off so we can get through some of the housekeeping. So thanks very much for joining us. It's great to see uh, so many people. We find these meetings actually result in more people being able to join, um, which is great. Uh, the most important thing to note just now is that the webinar will be recorded. Um, so just so you're aware of that, and um, there's further information on the screen about that. Uh, we'll, we'll kick off just shortly and we will aim to finish no later than 8.30. Um, I will do my very, very best to ensure that we are all out the door and having a cup of tea at 8.31. Um, so you're very welcome to leave your um, cameras on, but you're also very welcome to turn them off. Just do as you wish and just be aware that it is being recorded. There's a link on the screen just now to our privacy notice. Now, what we'll do in the during the evening is um, we will um, have a presentation, uh, then I'll welcome the panel, and then we'll have questions and answers. And I'd like to invite you all um, to ask questions, and you can do that in a number of ways. So you can raise your hand function, I'll come to you, uh, and you can ask it in person, or if you'd rather not do that, please put it in the chat box. Um, and you can ask questions in the chat box as we go along, or chat amongst yourselves. Um, it's always quite good to see what chat happens in the chat box, actually. It's sometimes more interesting than, than some of the chat um, here. So we really enjoy that. And please feel free to pop in the chat just now where you're joining us from, which is always it's always interesting to see what kind of a spread we get over the area that these um, meetings are for. And at the very end, we'll have a feedback with a survey link, um, which will appear in the chat box. We do these sessions on a regular basis. Um, we try to adapt to what you want. We can only make them better if we hear what works and what doesn't. So please do give us your feedback. Now I will go, I'll pop along back to do the introductions now that more of you have come in. So my name is Sally Reynolds. I'm one of the Scottish Land Commissioners. Um, I live out in the Outer Hebrides and tonight I will be chairing this session. And I'm joined um, by our chair, Andrew Thin, who's also one of our land commissioners and chairs the board, another land commissioner, David Adams, and one of our members of staff, David Stewart. And that will be the panel tonight for asking questions. Most importantly, we are joined by Jess behind the scenes who keeps everything running and keeps everything right. So a big thank you to Jess for keeping us, keeping the show on the road and doing the, the, the hosting on the technical side of things. Um, I'm going to pass over to um, Andrew now, who's going to do the presentation. So and Andrew and I like to swap when we're both on these. We like to swap for a night. So it means Andrew can be can uh, can talk a bit more and um, uh, be a wee bit more controversial. That's my what I reckon he normally does. Uh, so I'll share and he'll he'll do the presentation and then I'll. Um, and then I'll come to the rest of the panel to do a brief introduction to themselves, and then it'll be opening up to yourselves for questions. So thanks again for joining us, and over to you, Andrew. Hi, thank you very much indeed. I'm sure I'm never controversial. That's that's uh, I'm sure that's slander or something. That's terrible. Um, thank you very much for for, for joining us. So th these these meetings are hugely important. Um, uh, what I'm going to do is just set the scene and give you a quick rundown on sort of who we are, what we're currently up to. But the point of these meetings is for us to understand the priorities of the Scottish people. And because Scotland is a very diverse country, um, the priorities of the people of West Lothian will not be the same as the priorities of, of, of the people of Shetland um, or indeed um, Dumfries. So it, these meetings take place every month and uh, covering a different bit of the country so that we can understand the priorities of people in different parts of the country. So uh, after I've done my research sort of scene setter for 15 minutes or so, the, the conversation is, is hugely important to us. The chat, whether you use the chat button, the, the function there and type in your thoughts, or whether you put your hand up and contribute verbally, doesn't matter. We want to hear from you, please. So please participate. Um, but let me just run through I really, it will have to be a gallop as to who we are, what we do, sort of stuff. And of course, this is where I can't get things to work, but I'll get there. There we go. So, land reform. Um, the, the Scottish Land Commission was, um, it, 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 we're a very, really a very young organisation, and we're set up, in essence, and I generalise here, to advise the government and to advise wider interested parties on 
the, the sort of land reform journey that Scotland has been on actually for a long time, but which has certainly accelerated since the Scottish Parliament was created in 99. Um, but let's not kid ourselves, land reform is has been an issue for Scotland for well over a century. And, and in particular, it's been an issue in relation to the fact that Scotland has such a concentrated pattern of, of land ownership. 400 odd people own half the country, it's extraordinary. No other country in Europe is anything like as concentrated as that. And it's, it has caused tensions, it's caused issues for well over 100 years. The slide on the left there is actually where the Vatican Raiders um, um, went and, and, and forcefully settled land belonging to Lady Cathcart. And there are many, many examples right of that. So that's probably what land reform is, is, is most known for, if you like, is trying to deal with this issue of power and power co concentration of power. But it's also actually Scotland's response to that power um, until fairly recently has largely been about giving more rights and more security to, ten to tenants of these big landowners, to tenant farmers and to crofters. So, so tenant farming and crofting have also for a long time, certainly since the 1880s, been central to land reform. And we've gradually, uh, if you like, rebalanced the power so that tenants and crofters also have power. And that's been our, tended to be our approach. But more recently, land reforms become more complicated and I think also more urgent in some ways. So now you're seeing soaring land values in Scotland for the purposes of capturing carbon and selling carbon credits, carbon sequestration. And also, I think increasingly, you're going to see soaring land values for the purposes of biodiversity uh, gain, where mechanisms can be found to pay for that. And at the moment, because of the concentrated pattern, the benefit from most of that is going to accrue to a very small number of people, most of whom don't actually live here anyway. So there's some real issues in there. There's also in an urban environment, and this is very relevant in West Central, uh, West Lothian, is, and, and, and in fact, the whole of West Central Scotland, um, is the whole issue of, of vacant and derelict land. We, we've got an appalling record in Scotland uh, of not addressing the problem of vacant and derelict land, of allowing these places to blight the lives of, of, of often of communities, some of our least affluent, most disadvantaged communities are the ones that are most blighted by vacant and derelict land. So huge efforts now beginning to happen. Uh, prompted by us to some extent, actually, um, to, to find ways of using vacant and derelict land um, for productive purposes. That photograph is actually a, a kid's a BMX park built on vacant and derelict land. Fantastic. But all of a sudden, this land is doing something useful for society. Um, and there's all sorts of other examples. Land reform is also, in some respect, about planning. Uh, and I don't want to overstate this because planning is a whole subject in itself. But the, the way and certainly the way in which we plan and manage land use priorities in Scotland is a land reform issue, including the use of compulsory powers. People know very well that um, we have powers of compulsory purchase in Scotland, but no one until recently has talked about compulsory sale orders. But the Land Commission has, in fact, recommended that as, as another tool. So the whole way in which land is used and the way in which that use is direct is a land reform issue. We have some of the most, I mean, it's interesting, in some ways we're quite behind the curve on land and land reform in Scotland, but in other ways we're right at the front of it. Our access legislation is some of the most progressive, most imaginative in the world, and certainly in Western Europe. We rank probably alongside Norway as being at the front of the game. But of course, the way in which people use land and, 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 and water is changing. No one had thought about paddle boards, for example, um, when the access legislation was put in place. So we've got to keep up with this. Community ownership is another thing that has happened pretty much in my, my, during my career. I, I, I was a, a very small part of one of the first community buyouts up in Loch Enver in 1994. Um, since then, it's snowballed. 75% of the Western Isles is now community owned. But what's also, and I think really importantly happening, is that people are starting to say, look, community ownership doesn't just need to apply to 
to communities who are exasperated with their landowner and want to take over and sort it out. Community ownership can apply to all sorts of other things. And we now have community owned buildings, old churches. We have community owned cinemas. We have a community owned bridge actually near Perth. And, and we have community, you know, an, another, an, another good example, communities getting fed up with the people running public toilets and taking over and doing it themselves. It's, it's a tremendous shift and it's part of land reform. And the picture on the right is actually my granny's hut. And some of you, it's in West Linton, so it's not quite in that West Linton, but it's not far off. Um, some, some of you will know the history of, of, of hutting, but the whole business actually, looking forward of, of the way in which we start to diversify the tools we use to diversify ownership and diversify tenure, dilute the power of big landowners, increase people's access to land, whether it's for housing, for amenity, for uh, uh, hatting, for whatever, for crofting, or for whatever else. There's, there's a huge um, range of opportunities, I think, now. We've also dipped a toe in the water on tax and financial support in relation to land. It's worth remembering that over half the nation's wealth is held in the form of land. And yet we don't tax that value to any great extent. So there's some serious, and we've made some initial recommendations, there's some serious opportunities to rethink the way we tax land um, and tax the value that's in land. And it's telling, I think, that um, a large private landowner recently said to me, well, one of the reasons I own land is because it's not heavily taxed, um, so I can protect my wealth. So that tells you something. And certainly if you're of my children's generation, land for housing is probably one of, one of your biggest concerns at the moment. In the last 25 years, the cost of building a house has broadly kept pace with inflation. The cost of buying a piece of land to stick that house on has vastly exceeded the rate of, in, of, in, of inflation. So, so the issue here is, is land. It's not, it, it, the, the whole housing challenge is one of land. So, so Parliament said in 2016, 17, look, we need to have our, we need to get focused on this. We've done a lot since, when, since the Parliament was created in 99. We've had a couple of land reform bills, we've made progress, but we really need to give this energy and, and, and drive now. So they established the Scottish Land Commission uh, in the Land Reform Act 2016, although we actually started in 17. And our job is to provide advice and recommendations, first and foremost to government, but not just to government. And we give advice to, to, to local government, to the private sector, to the third sector uh, as well. We're a national organization. We cover the whole of Scotland. We're a very small organization. We're um, 12, 15, uh, staff. That's that's all. We're, we're not a huge. We're, we're you could you could call us a a we think tank, I suppose. Although we do more than just think, actually. But we're we're pretty small. And and Parliament said as well that the last thing that Parliament said was, look, let's let's do this in three year bites. So let's let's produce a plan every three years saying here's the issues you're going to focus on for the next three years. And let's agree that with Parliament. So every three years, we agree a plan for the next three years with Parliament and with government. And we're just coming to the end of the one we're on. So this conversation this evening is hugely important in informing the plan that we will put to, to Parliament in the autumn. There was a fundamental concept put in place by Parliament in 2016, and I think it's worth just reminding ourselves of it. Um, and that's a wee photograph, of actually, of the bit of the of the of the Parliamentary Act. But what 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 Parliament said was, look, if you are going to own a land in Scotland, then you are also taking on responsibilities. You cannot separate those two things. With land rights, go responsibilities. And if you don't want to take on the responsibilities, don't take on the land rights either. They are inseparable. It was a very important, and I think I think history will judge that. That, that particular moment very kindly looking back. It's already embedding itself. I already hear landowners saying to me, well, of course, I know I've got responsibilities. I never heard that 20 years ago. So that was a big piece of progress. This is what we're working on at the moment. Um, it'll come to the end, as I say, in the autumn when we agree with Parliament our next three year priorities. But at the moment, we're working on three things, reforming land rights. So land rights are not static, they can be changed. Secondly, 
the, the whole idea of responsibility, as I've said. So, so how, what does responsibility look like and how do we hold people accountable? That's at the second area. And third, land markets are changing um, and, and in some ways are not particularly, particularly actually in urban Scotland, they're a bit dysfunctional. Um, people can people can can block things and all the rest of it. So there's a need to to reform land markets. I'll say a wee bit more about each, but not a lot. So reforming land rights. There will come before Parliament later this year a land reform bill for 2023. There's been a big consultation on it. I hope some of you are aware of that and have contributed. Um, a very large number of people did contribute. I forget the, the final total, but it was something extraordinary. Um, it was called Land Reform in a Net Zero Na Nation. It was out last summer. It lasted right through to Christmas. It's a manifesto a commitment to address the concentration of land ownership, the concentration of power. That's been the central issue for the SNP. But it was also in the Green Manifesto. So it was a joint SNP and Green commitment. The consultation set out a range of pro uh, proposals, which essentially strengthens the, the emphasis on responsibilities, strengthens this idea that if you're going to own land rights, and particularly if you're going to own a big scalp of land rights, then my goodness, you better fulfill your responsibilities as well. So let's put some controls on power. And thirdly, and this may prove very important in 50 years time looking back, it said, look, actually it may not be in the public interest for these big holdings to exist. They may in fact be localized monopolies, and they are sometimes localized monopolies, there's no question. You know, there are examples where landowners own, you know, 5,000 acres plus, plus the garage, plus the hotel, plus the shop, you know, and so on, and plus half the houses in the village. I can take you to a, a village where, where the lady from, from the big house used to come and tell you what color your door should be painted. So, um, you know, these places exist. So government in the consultation said, let's have a public interest test on the transfer of these big holdings. And maybe, maybe when a big holding has changed its hands, government should require it to be broken up into lots. That might be in the public interest. If it's not in the public interest, they, they shouldn't intervene. But if it is in the public interest, maybe they should. So that's one thing. Secondly, community ownership um, continues to be a big priority and we play our part in that. It's been developing since the 1990s. It's been funded, a, a huge amount of it has been funded by private money, by, by, by contribution, contributions from all over the place, but also increasingly by the Scottish Land Fund, which is publicly funded. And government is very committed to the Scottish Land Fund uh, um, going, uh, going forward. 75% of the Western Isles, is already a community owned as a result of all that, so remarkable statistic, but of course, much less in other parts of Scotland, much less in the south of Scotland, actually much less in, in urban Scotland, as you'd expect. But it involves, I've said it before, land, woodland, buildings, bridges, all the rest of it. There is legislation in place providing a community right to buy in extreme circumstances, but it is constrained, it's very difficult. European Convention on Human Rights uh, protects the, the, the right to the peaceful enjoyment of your property as a human right. And that's, that's important, it's fundamental to our economy. People need to be able to have confidence in property rights or they won't invest in property. So the, the circumstances where a community can force uh, an acquisition are really quite tightly defined as going to be a very clear and strong public interest. The Land Commission is now working on what we're calling shared governance models. And I think this, this will be very interesting. You'll see, I think you'll see over the next few years, more and more situations where actually the land is owned by some sort of a company or a charity or whatever it is, but the board that directs what happens will involve um, shared rights. And there are, there are some examples already. Noidark, for example, there are already shared rights between the local community and the John Muir Trust. Egg, um, shared rights between the local community and the Scottish Wildlife Trust, I think it is. So there are examples already, and I think you'll see more of these coming forward. Um, and we've got to try and diversify ownership and control, but it isn't easy because of the human rights and property rights point that I made. That's actually a crofting township, and it shows you what happens if you diversify control. 
you end up, you know, people build a house and they have a strip of land and they have their sheep or whatever it is, but it changes the landscape, it changes the way things are. If it weren't for crofting tenure, I don't think any of those houses would be there. And I don't think any of the kids would be in the school just along the road. So diversifying ownership and control is important, but it's difficult. Um, and an, an area of work where I think we need to, it's, it's still early days for us. Somehow or other, we've got to find a way of balancing property rights and the, 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 the right to, of, that owners of property have to, to, to within reason do what they like with their property on the one hand and the rights of all the rest of us to you know to, 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 to live a decent life in, in, in various ways it's a tricky it's a tricky business um, and one that you may have views on it's certainly an area we need to do more work let's talk a wee bit about this whole business of responsibilities that go with rights um, so what we've done on this one is we we published a whole range of protocols and tools and guidance and all the rest of it that set out what we think responsible looks like. And I'm, I am pretty encouraged. Most big landowners are now working to these. Most land agents, professional advisors to big landowners are working to these. And they were described to me by the chief executive of Scottish Lands and Estates who represent big, big landowners um, as the script that landowners should be following. So I'm encouraged but they're still in effect voluntary. We can put a lot of pressure on people, moral pressure. Um, the court of public opinion will, will offer a view on, on, on these things. But at the end of the day, they're still pretty voluntary. And one of the things in the consultation for the, the land reform bill later this year is a thought that this needs to be strengthened a bit. In the meantime, we have been and we will work with owners, work with advisors, work with communities and help them to get this right. The Tenant Farming Commissioner has a special role because uh, it was Parliament was particularly concerned in 2016 at the level of conflict between landowners and, and tenant farmers. So the Tenant Farming Commissioner was created as a special position. And um, he is very similar to the protocol thing. I you know, He produces codes of practice which do have some legal underpinning. He has powers to put in place mediation when there's disagreements. And he is also working extremely hard, actually, to bring new people into that whole uh, business, succession planning and so on. Lastly, on the whole business of land markets. So I mentioned earlier, Bacon's and Dalek, I'm going to say a wee bit more about this, because the fact that Scotland has such a large amount of vacant and Dalek land, and the fact that it is concentrated in central Scotland, often, very often, adjacent to disadvantaged communities. It's really a disgrace, actually, by European standards. Most of the rest of Western Europe ha um, has tackled this, it's essentially a post-war issue, and we haven't. And part of the reason we haven't is because we haven't got in law the same powers for local authorities and others to get a grip on this as other countries have, have, have done. So we... We did a lot of work on this. We produced recommendations for changing, changes to the law, which are with government at the moment. But we also, in the meantime, set up this so-called task force and government put 50 million pounds, uh, uh, made, made 50 million available for it. And they are making tremendous progress in making things happen on a voluntary basis. And here's a few things. So there's top left community that's, that said, look, we don't like this vacant lot we're going to take it over and we're going to build allotments um, so that was that 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 worked fine on the right and um, is is a vacant and derelict building that's been turned into house bottom left people said no actually what we want is a play play, play park for kids and, and bottom and sorry did i say bottom right bottom left that was and then bottom right is a, a community that said no what we want is to turn this into a local nature reserve. and there's all sorts of other things that people could do but there's there's great progress being made there Housing is a massive issue in Scotland, uh, and, and every, everywhere we go in Scotland, pe people think it's an issue. It's, it's an issue for their area. It's actually an issue for every area of Scotland. It is a, and we have to crack it. We've published some really quite strong advice, and again, I'm, I make the point that in other parts of Europe, local government 
often has greater powers to make things happen. Um, whereas in Scotland, we tend to, to the, the powers aren't there, and so we tend to have to wait for landowners to to, to take to, to to take the initiative, if you like. So we so we what we said was that reforms are actually needed to the way in which land's brought forward for housing, so that so that democratically accountable bodies, probably local authorities, have greater capacity to say, right, right, we're going to, this is what we're going to do, and we're going to do it. They don't have to wait for a landowner to bring it forward, and then the local authority says, oh, that's very kind of you. Um, yes, you can have planning permission, uh, that, that, if you like, speculative model, because the speculative model is not delivering enough housing, and the public sector needs to be more active if we're going to get the results that we need. Tax, I've said already, I'll say it again, is potentially significant, it's difficult. There are all sorts of things that you have to think through. Tax can have all sorts of unforeseen consequences. I've probably had more um, comments from members of the public telling me how, you know, if only, if only we did such and such on tax, everything would be great than anything else. It's not that easy. We've done a lot of work looking at what other parts of Europe do, what other parts of Europe have tried to do and failed. But there is no doubt that there is, there is an opportunity to tax land values in a different way and to tax land in a way that supports wider land reform objectives. So we put the two things together. Tax is often seen simply in terms of raising money for public services, but tax can also be a tool in directing the way people behave. And, and I think the big one for the next five or 10 years, so I mean, I'm, and I'm guessing, well, more than guessing, I strongly suspect this will be a big theme of the next three-year plan, is this whole business of carbon capture uh, and natural capital investment in Scotland. Prices of, of land where you can capture carbon one way or another, in trees or peat or whatever, are soaring. They're doubling, trebling over a period of two or three years. We published advice on that, uh, information on that. We're about to publish some more. The challenge is how, so, so all that money is pouring into Scotland. Um, and, and, and there's an, a, an announcement actually today on Tay Valley Estate, where again, vast amounts of money coming in, in that, in that instance, um, uh, for biodiversity support. How do, we, how do we harness that money to, to support ordinary people and support the aspirations of ordinary people and particularly, and especially, the people who live on that land. Too often uh, in Scotland, things are done to people who live on land. They're not done with people or for people. Uh, and we need to try and get that. So we need to, to, there's a lot of work, I think, to spell out what responsible practice looks like and then make it happen. And we're a long way from that. I do, I can't resist this. Um, we're only five or six years old, but already we're having you know, quite a bit of, 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 of influence well beyond Scotland. And I was really amused. Our first three-year plan, which we agreed with Parliament, is the one on the left. It was called Making More of Scotland's Land. I was very amused to find the House of Lords publishing a report just the other day called Making the Most Out of England's Land. And if that doesn't tell you that we're having a wider influence, I don't know what does. I couldn't resist putting that one in. To close, really, and pass back to Sally, Sources of other information. We've we've created this new um, online hub, particularly aimed at younger people, so you can learn more about, you know, what what you can do, um, and particularly, you know, what people in urban communities but rural communities too can do. And uh, people often feel powerless in all this, and and we're not powerless. We're only as powerless as we think we are. Um, so that that's a great source of of, of information. Um, and our own website, uh, which is there, is, is absolutely stacked now with, with information that we've published over the last five years, and we'll continue to add to that masses of advice. Also, if you want to contact us, that's how to do so. And I think that's enough, Sally, I'll pass back to you. Thanks very much, Andrew. I knew you'd put something in. I knew you'd put something in I hadn't seen before. That was interesting. So thank you very much. That was great. So um, I haven't uh, seen any questions yet in the chat or any hands up. Um, I'm going to go and ask the panel to introduce themselves now, but please do um, come forward with any questions you have or raise your hand if you'd like to. So I'm going to ask um, David Adams now just to give a very brief introduction. 
Hi, I'm David Adams. I'm based uh, at the moment in the Scottish Borders, uh, but I am um, Emeritus Professor of Urban Studies at the University of Glasgow, uh, where I spent the last part of my academic career. Uh, my interests in land are especially in relation to, to vacant and derelict land, hence the photograph behind me, um, and in relation to housing and uh, in relation to community right to buy. Um, so uh, if anything comes up on those, I'll, I'll be very happy to, to contribute. Thanks, Sally. Thanks very much, David. And now we'll pass to David Stewart, our uh, other David. So thanks for joining us tonight, David. Thanks very much, Sally. Yes, hello, I'm David Stewart. I'm a policy and practice lead and I work mainly on land for housing, place making and a bit on land reuse. Um, my background is I've really always worked on housing development and regeneration. Thanks very much, David. Um, and we've heard from Andre and um, I introduced myself at the beginning. And just to give a, a, a bit of further background, um, I live out in the Outer Hebrides. I'm, I'm from here originally, born and bred. And I was absolutely delighted in Andy's talk to hear him talking about crofting so positively um, because I, I am an active crofter and I do now live on my own tentative croft. And in, in my day job, um, when I'm not a land commissioner, I work for a community owned estate um, out in the Western Isles. So I'm part of, I live on a community owned estate and I work for a different community owned estate. So I'm very much part of that 75%. Um, that comes with lots of challenges, but it's been quite exciting to be part of this. Um, and it, I guess it's just a slightly different perspective. But I'll be I'm happy to share any perspective on that or answer any questions. Um, so as you'll see tonight, we've got quite a varied panel um, and we'd love to have your questions. And as, as there is no questions yet, I am going to ask um, David Adams, if he could just expand a bit on some of the vacant and derelict task force work and kind of how that came about and what he's seen change as a result of that in the sector. Okay, thanks, Sally. Um, I mean, I think the background to the task force is that um, the, the total amount of vacant and derelict land in Scotland for, for many years had remained fairly static. I mean, there'd been some, some sites coming um, into use and other sites putting vacant and derelict, but overall the problem had really not been uh, sufficiently well addressed. So what um, the Commission realised was there's a huge number of different organisations involved one way or another in trying to solve the problem. Uh, some in the public sector, but, but many in the private sector or the voluntary sector as well. And really what we did, uh, which I think was a, a, a very crucial part of moving the debate forward, was to bring all those people together and work out uh, what were the main things that needed to be done uh, to, to resolve um, and lesser vacancy in dereliction. And some of them were fairly straightforward around um, the need for better information and better registration of land. Um, and some of them were um, more challenging in terms of uh, resources needed um, and legislative changes. Uh, so, we, we spent about a couple of years working with all the key stakeholders and produced what I think was, was quite an influential report because the result of that was the Scottish Government committed um, this sum of £50 million over, I think, five years. Uh, and the first sites uh, have started to get funding through that programme um, and are starting to work through towards uh, delivering completion and other sites have come on board. So I think if you know of, of an area of vacant and derelict land in your locality that could benefit from the programme, then all you have to do is to uh, be in touch with your council um, and persuade them to, to, to put it forward and perhaps work with a local community body. Um, and there's a good chance through that programme, and I think, as Andrew said, it's fair to say uh, through the initiative of the Commission that work is being done now to tackle some of the, the long-standing vacant and derelict land. So I'm pleased to see that, but uh, there's an awful lot to do. You could probably have that programme going for 20 years and you still have a, 
<laughs> no problem. Thanks, Sally. Thanks, David. That's great. And I will, um, I should have said earlier, you will see lots of links coming up in the chat. Um, thank you very much to Jess, who's keeping keeping the chat full of information. So if there's a particular topic we're talking about and you want to know more about it, there'll be a link in the chat there. Now, we've had a question come into the chat, so thanks very much to Dean for this question. And I'm going to put this to Andrew. And that is, is foreign ownership of land an issue? And they've got foreign and inverted commas. Dean, thanks. I think, it's, I think it is a really important question. First of all, um, and it's often it's often discussed in quite shallow ways. Um, what what we can say is that there are some extremely good, popular, foreign based landowners in Scotland, <laughs> um, and we what we can say is that there are others who um, are are really not not particularly helpful. Um, uh, who who are not particular who, who are who, who own the land for a, often a single sporting related purpose and and unless they employ good local land agents um, and give them uh, a fair bit of freedom, I, I, th I think that could, you know that is not a good thing. Um, I, I I guess I would discourage being too simplistic about foreign versus local I, I could i could certainly point you to large scottish based landowners who do not do a good job and i could certainly point you to large overseas based landowners who do go do a good job and i could do the the, the inverse as well of course there's some great scottish landowners there too what what parliament said in 2016 i think is probably about as helpful as anything parliament said look if you're going to own land and if you're going to make decisions about that land it's you, you must engage and, 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 and genuinely and meaningfully engage with local people and local elected representatives in your decision making processes, because it's not just you that's affected by those, those decisions. So if you own more than a pretty small bit of land, if, even if it's a family farm or something, fine. But if you own a thousand or two thousand, five thousand acres, pretty much any decision you make is going to impact other people. And so you must engage those other people. And that doesn't, that's whether you're foreign or local, and um, you know, whether you're English, Scottish, whatever, you, you, you must do that. And, and I, I would encourage us to think much more about how, how, how does responsible and effective ownership work rather than is this person foreign or not? Thanks, Andrew. Um, we've had another question come in and it's been um, directed to Andrew. Um, but what I'm actually going to do is I'm going to ask David Stewart to respond to it first and then I'll come to Andrew. And, and David Adams may actually have some input to this as well. So I think what I'll do is I'll actually just open it up to the whole panel. But I'll come first to David Stewart, if that's OK, Andrew, just to give you a chance to read it, because I know David's read it. Um, and just in case any of you are not able to see the chat for any reason, I'll just summarise this. It's obviously quite a specific local case, which we won't be able to comment on specifics to a case, but um, it does ask if we're aware of similar similar things. So, so it's a piece of land that has um, not been allocated for housing by the local authority or the local community, um, but the landowner went direct to the report at Scottish Government and without any consultation, it's now been allocated on the local development plan and it's now for sale for housing development. Um, so there's two questions of, um, what what would what would you advise in that scenario? Or um, I'm not 100 percent sure um, who Helen represents, but I think um, obviously as a local of the mem member of the community. So some reflections on that. Uh, but also, are you aware of this happening elsewhere? So I'll pass it first to David. Um, we probably don't want to get bogged down in specifics because we won't know too much about it. But David should be able to give us a good kind of background to it. And then I'll pass to Andrew and Dave, David Adams. Um, as well. So over to you, David Stewart. Thank you, and thanks, Helen. It's a, a very good question. It, it is um, something that you hear of happening occasionally in other places in Scotland, and I think at the heart of what's happened here is, at the moment, 
local authorities have a requirement to have a supply of land that will meet housing needs. And in some ways, that's an opportunity for landowners or developers to look where they can argue there isn't the supply of allocated land with plant land with planning permission to meet housing needs, and they can bring forward other sites. Um, that should largely be changing in the future because there's a relatively new planning act. There's a new national planning framework uh, that should cover development and land use till 2050. And that's looking to move very much more to local authorities and, and communities allocating where sites should be. And that's very much based around the local place and what the local place needs. But um, it's something I've heard of before. I can see it would be frustrating. And it was interesting in the review of land for housing, we looked at Northwestern European countries with a good track record on delivering housing in high quality places. And a difference between our planning system and theirs was government very much has control over where, where development happens. And I'll we'll maybe leave it for the other members of the, the panel to make other comments. Thanks, David. Um, Andrew, do you want to come in as well? The question was directed to you, so I want to give you your opportunity to come back. Yeah, thanks, Helen. So it doesn't happen very often, this, but I, I think we do need to understand what, what's happening here. Um, Local government has a view about how much land is needed for housing, and so does national government. And sometimes those won't be the same, um, because Scotland is, you know, it's an integrated country. You can't, you know, West Lothian is not an island. Um, so, so inevitably, uh, there will be times when there is a difference of view. I'm not going to to to, to judge who was who was right in that instance, but the, 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 there is a mechanism in in in, in planning whereby national government can say, well, actually, it's in the national interest that we do whatever it is. Sometimes it's, as in this instance, you know, government has said, look, it's in the national interest that we have more houses in this location. Sometimes it's the opposite and you get, you know, I used to chair Scottish Natural Heritage and um, I was forever getting beaten up in public meetings because government had decided to block something that a local government wanted to happen. So it cuts both ways. And th these tensions, I think, will always be there. It's just the nature of the system we operate. Um, I, I, I'm not going to comment on the merit of the decision because I simply don't know the ins and outs of it. Um, you know, democratically elected people at, at local and national level have come to a different view, and that's that's the way it is. Um, I'll come um, on to the, uh, the civic trust point later, maybe, Sally, but... Yeah, that's fine. Thank you very much. Um, David Adams, did you want to come in on this at all? Yeah, this is this is very interesting, because actually it happens all over Scotland. Um, and, I mean, I think we just have to bear in mind there's two systems going on. One is the local authority um, trying rationally to decide how much housing is needed and where it should go. And the other system is a bit more hidden, which is developers and landowners buying and um, selling sites and coming forward with plans for development. And at some stage, bringing those to the um, knowledge of the local authority. So let me take the latter and say what the uh, the Commission is doing about the latter, which is um, we currently are undertaking research on uh, what they call options and conditional contracts, which are actually hidden from public view. Um, you don't know which pieces of land developers have got their eyes on and are going to try um, to put forward to reporters uh, next time round and get them agreed uh, against the wish of the local authority. If there was a register, of uh, those um, options and conditional contracts so that at least communities can keep their eye out. And that's one, one issue that the, the Commission is exploring and will be uh, giving advice to the Scottish Government at some stage. Then standing back, I think um, what you have is, um, Ideally, you really want to bring those two systems together. You really want 
local authorities to have much more control over um, the buying and selling of land and, and, and which pieces of land actually come forward and are offered for development or not. So if you look at all the work the Commission has done on public interest-led development, has done on our, our paper, which Andrew referred to much earlier on in terms of housing, we're actually saying that we need a, a completely different approach to the way land is developed for housing, both in terms obviously to um, keep communities better informed, but to produce better quality development and to reduce the housing shortages, because that's actually at the core of, of why these kind of things happen. So Andrew's right. I mean, we're, we're not here to get into planning. We're not here to criticize particular uh, decisions by particular local authorities. But we have actually said some fairly radical things about the way in which the housing supply system works. And were the Scottish government to take those up, uh, the kind of problems you have identified would happen much less in future. Um, who knows whether those are going to be taken up or not, but you might want to look at the, uh, the recommendations the Commission has made and see whether you agree with them or not. Thanks, Sally. Thanks, David. That's really interesting. And um, as always, housing is a really hot topic in these public meetings wherever we go in Scotland, and it's the one topic that affects everyone in different ways and in different scenarios and some are, and sometimes in the same ways. But it's um it's really interesting to hear that. Um, on a kind of related topic, there's a question here um, that I'm hoping David Stewart will be able to just um, offer a little bit of insight on. And he may we may need to, to signpost, um, but just uh, Pauline's asked what support is there to help local community bodies develop their own local place plans? And how could local authorities engage this and build capacity in the local community? And, and um, <sighs> you may not have direct advice on this. You may want to talk about some of the changes that are coming, David, in, uh, in the kind of planning reforms. But a little bit of insight, that would be useful. Thanks, David. Thanks, Sally. And thanks for the question. It, it, it's a great question. I think the short answer is at this stage, we don't know for certain and also vary across different local authorities, depending on the importance they attach to local place plans and the resources they're, they're willing to make available. But I do think it's a, a very exciting development, and, and certainly from housing, we're aware that the way the, the development model works in Scotland, they're really private developers tend to build in, in certain areas that are hot spots and have high values. And there's a bit of a gap either sometimes in regeneration areas or in rural areas. And often that can be filled by communities and there's been some great work with communities leading development, delivering housing, but also delivering other important amenities. And I think local place plans have the potential to provide a clearer route and a structure to allow them to, to do that and have that actually adopted by local authorities. But the, the big question is, what will support be available? I would suggest getting in touch with your, your local planning department to have a discussion about that. But another organisation that are very good on this um, they, they used to be called Planning Aid Scotland, they're now called PAS, and they really do two things. They still provide an advice line for, for people with any queries on a particular planning issue, but they also do some really good work with communities, helping them to engage in planning, and they might well be able to offer support or, or maybe help access funding to look to develop a local place plan. So that that's really the two places I, I would signpost to for that. Thanks very much, David. And um, Jess has put a link to PAS in the, in the chat. So thanks very much, Jess, and thanks for that, David. Um, I'm going to go um, to a question that, that came in earlier now, and then I'm going to come back to some of the derelict land questions. And I'm going to pass this one over to Andrew. So thank you very much to Gordon, who put in, and it's, it's fantastic to hear um, Lynn Lithgow Civic Trust and um, to hear about them doing great serious professional work. 
um, that's representative of the community. Um, that's really, really good to hear. But obviously, um, the question is, um, does community engagement extend to local authorities? So that's quite complicated. So there's different scenarios there. So, so I'll let Andrew expand on that. Um, but um, it's great to hear. In fact, there's some really good examples of stuff here in the chat that I'm really enjoying reading. Um, but over to you, Andrew, for this kind of issue here. Thanks, Sally. Yeah, uh, Gordon, I saw your question. I was really quite keen to respond. So thank you, for Sally, for letting me. Um, I, until fairly recently, I spent eight years chairing Scottish Canals. So I know the area and I, there's some amazing energy and competence and, and ability around Linlithgow um, to get things done. I think it's worth just standing back a wee bit from this, the specifics of the question to the white, and it actually ties into some of the other points. I think we're in a period of time in Scotland where, where the whole idea of community empowerment and, and what they call community wealth building, which is not just about money, it's about capacity, it's about human capital, um, is getting much more attention. And if I had a crystal ball, I think I would look forward and, 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 and think that in, in 10, 15 years' time, I think the whole business of the way in which local government gets things done will have shifted and it will have shifted to a more local level. Um, that, that will take time. It, it's not easy. People in local government are used to doing things in a particular way. And some of the sort of tensions that are in some of those questions reflects, I think, the fact that, that, that sometimes local government isn't local enough. And, and, and that's what's beginning to shift now. Community ownership has been a part of that, actually. Um, community ownership in the Western Isles, and we go to a completely different part of the country, community ownership in the Western Isles has empowered and built confidence in the most extraordinary way. And the local authority there has had to adapt to that quite fast, actually. You might actually want to say something about this yourself, Sally, even though you're chairing the thing, but because, you know, I mean, I remember the Western Isles from 25, 30 years ago, and it was a very, t well, in fact, I can remember it before the Western Isles Council was created, it shows how old I am, but um, it was a very top-down run uh, way, th things where everything was done from Stornoway. The, 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 what, what we're seeing now there, we're also seeing in central Scotland and southern Scotland and eastern Scotland, which is people beginning to believe that they can determine their own futures, communities be beginning to believe that. Um, and communities, and this is not, you, people often say to me, well, it's only the sort of wealthy, middle-class, educated communities that can do anything. That's nonsense. Some of the most dynamic and effective communities are in some of the most deprived bits of Scotland. And, and in a way, it's that very deprivation that has created the determination. So I think what we'll see is uh, local authorities will adapt to this slowly. Implicit in Gordon's question is, is, is the sense that perhaps the local authorities, when you say at the end, generally they get short shrift from council officials. Well, council officials are learning and you may have to help them. I mean, let's not get into squabbles here. Um, you know, communities and, and civic trusts have a job to do as well to help, help that. I mean, I have certainly seen development trusts, for example, go into talk to local authorities as if they were going into battle, which is really unhelpful. <laughs> you know, this has got to be much more collaborative and, and, and based on mutual understanding. But I am, I am very optimistic that we're going to see a, a, a serious change. And there's no certainly, if, if I'm right, there's no question in my mind at all that, that, that there's a huge capacity in West. I mean, we saw it, we saw it in, 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 in many other things when I was doing the canal job. There's huge capacity in West Lothian for a more localised driven um, uh, approach to, to well, well to, 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 to development, but to public services more generally. Thanks, Andrew. And that did touch on some other um, points we've had in some later questions. I'm going to come back to uh, a question here about derelict land and put it to David Adams. Um, so Gordon's come and given some really nice examples of putting derelict back, land back into community use. Um, so he's talking about a kind of woodland full of wildlife and he's also talking about a lagoon for wild swimmers, which is very close to my heart um, because I feel now like you can't live in the Hebrides without becoming a wild swimmer. So um, I'm absolutely delighted to read about that. Um, and then there's a, there's a further question um, from Dean 
um, about in the 1970s, the then Scottish Development Agency had a large programme of rehabilitating derelict land. And why is this model not used now? So I wanted to ask David Adams if he could reflect on that. And, and is that part of the journey to where we've ended up now, which is very much how I think about we had HIDB and we had Highlands and Islands Enterprise in this area. I don't know your area so well. And I feel that that's been a part of the journey to where we've got to now with community ownership and with our kind of community um, control over things. So I just wonder, is that part of the journey of the, the kind of methods of dealing with Delic land and it's brought us to here? Or have we seen a different kind of pattern over time? So just some reflections on that would be really interesting, David. Yeah, yeah. Um, I think that is a very interesting, relevant point. I, I, I've actually been tracking for some time, um, I say sometime two decades, uh, the, the, the total quantity of vacant dead land in Scotland. And it stopped falling, coincidental with the abolition of the Scottish Development Agency or its successor. And then it remained static for a very, very long period of time. Um, and what, what, what happened was, well, my view is the government took their eye off the ball, but, but that's supposed to be what, what, what happened was um, land became uh, thought to be less important and all the funding went into business. And the, the, the Scottish Development Agency eventually got swallowed up by Scottish Enterprise and Scottish Enterprise started um, cutting back on funding on land and eventually had very little funding on land. And I don't think it was a coincidence that the result of that was the total amount remained very static for about 15 years. Um, what I think has happened uh, is we've, we've recaptured that now. We, we, we've, we've begun, um, the Commission has been very crucially involved, but others have been involved as well to say, we do need to be, we do need to be prioritizing vacant derelict land. We do need to be putting money in. Um, there are organizations such as uh, Clyde Gateway, such as um, other, other organizations across Scotland that, that have had a profile. But what, what, what we've seen recently is the money has been going back in. And actually this last year, um, if you sort of track the total, the last year has been the first year in which we've seen significant reduction in, in the total amount. Now, I don't know whether that's because there's been uh, a refocus, but the point about the lack of an agency and the lack of focus for quite a long time is absolutely right. And unless you have organisations like the Scottish Land Commission and Clyde Gateway and others really seeing this as a priority, well, it'll get lost in all the other priorities. Um, so let's hope that, that this last year, when it started to fall again, um, is followed through in, in, in coming years and we get back to what was happening in the late, in the 1980s and early 1990s, when actually the problem was tackling. I suspect Andrew might have something to add to that because he, uh, you, you were involved in some of those issues as well, Andrew, at the time, I think. Well. Yeah, so so briefly, yeah, not the not not the nineteen seventies, David. I was still in school in the nineteen seventies, but but uh, I was very I was um, uh, uh, yes, I was involved in the SDA, and actually the SDA funding went on into in it. Uh, um, it was still there, um, eighty nine through to ninety one. Um, uh, but I agree with your analysis entirely. I mean, I think what happened was there was a shift of priorities, perfectly understandable. There was a few taken that that uh, what available money. The money that was there should, should should go into business. I think that's shifting, and and you you've actually seen it in the last few years in Scottish enterprise. You've seen a shift to to a strategy which they call they call placemaking, uh, uh, contextualised development. There's all sorts of phrases for it, but th this idea that best to put money into business is shifting to a different idea, which is actually best to put that money into creating the right circumstances where business can do its own thing and business will source whatever capital it needs from the markets. So it's, 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 it, it's definitely heading that way. Um, there's a stuff on the lo localizations there, Sally. I don't know if you want me to, I, I've not got a lot more to say about that, to be honest. Yeah, I, 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 
Yeah, feel free to answer just now. I saw that response and thought it was really interesting. Yeah, well, just briefly, so Gordon's put, put up more on this point, and he's, he's absolutely right. By, by European standards, we have a relatively centralised form of government and a centralised decision-making processes. And if you go to, I mean, there are loads of different models. There's no single model that I would say, oh, there's the perfect model. But, but, but what, 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 we, what we also need to recognise is to, to change Scotland's model if, if you were to try and do it in one go, it would be fantastically disruptive and fantastically expensive. And that's part of the challenge. I, I, I think this isn't just a debate about should we have a more localised democracy in Scotland? It's also a debate about, well, how, how realistically would you, would you get from A to B? I think we, have, we need to recognise the second part of that as well. It's too easy to say, well, if only we did such and such, everything would be fine. I, I'm not sure that it's, it's not a simple matter. Thank you. It's quite like the, the tax as well. It's that kind of, it's, it's not as simple as there's one, there's one key that can turn and unlock everything. Um, I want to go on to a slightly different topic now. There's a really interesting comment here from Jean, and actually, the, the the background to these questions and the background information that's coming in is showing an absolute passion here of a very um, a, an excellent community spirit and an excellent passion there, which is really, really interesting. So she talks about community solutions for the use of land can be highly effective in supporting the enablement of people realising their potential and lifting members of community out of poverty. And how can this be given just as much weighting as the need for housing, especially in regeneration areas? So that feeds into quite a bit of what Andrew spoke about earlier in terms of community wealth building and you know, some other things. But I just wanted to come to David Stewart on this um, because I know there was a new report published today that might be relevant to this um, and we contributed to that. Um, so I just wanted to sort of ask David if he had any thoughts on this question, but also to talk more generally about that new report that come out today. Thanks very much, Sally. And yes, I, I think it's a great question. And, and in some ways, it maybe links to another comment about most of the development in housing and West Lothian being standard house types and, and expensive detached houses. And, and really, that's because of the way the, the land market works and the way private developers manage risk. Um, Scottish Futures Trust today published a report looking at town centre living, and it begins by making the case about all the benefits that town centre living can make around regeneration, regenerating rather town centres, cutting carbon emissions, supporting active travel. But in spite of that, actually, when you, you look at the evidence of recent schemes, there's not that many, and they're almost all actually delivered for affordable housing by housing associations and, and councils. And, and I think the issue there just really is, is partly a, about the way developers work and the fact that they need to make a certain amount of profit to um, pay their shareholders and, and cover risk. But there's also something there about the way public bodies make investment decisions and the way they're expected to make a financial return. So just briefly, a, a couple of suggestions from the report that I think are quite useful. One is the idea of taking a well-being approach to making decisions. So not just looking at financial return, looking at health benefits and um, looking at jobs that, that are created. And that's the sort of thing that can allow, for example, regeneration in town centres or a site going to a community rather than a private developer. And the second um, recommendation, which I thought was interesting, was when affordable housing is developed, don't just look at the cost of the house and the rent, but look at the whole cost of living in the area. And I think their town centres or regeneration areas, they often already have amenities, and it makes more sense to use these and have people able to, to walk to them rather than building on green fields and then having, you know, car use and that actually having costs in terms of people's costs and petrol, but also carbon. Um, 
Andrew. So, Sally, can I just just make what a point which may be obvious to some, but not to others, that this whole business of community empowerment and community doing things isn't just about the projects themselves. It's what it does to the psychology of these communities. Um, and, um, you know, I could point to communities all over Scotland, big urban communities, um, very, very remote rural communities. It can be absolutely transformational in terms of the way that community thinks about itself and its capacity. And that then spins out because individuals and particularly young people in that community start to believe that they can do things. And that changes their whole their whole career paths in, in, in cases. So it's you know, I don't I don't think we can underestimate the importance of this 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 whole business of community empowerment, turning a, a country that at, at times is just you know, I, I don't want to sound negative, but there are times some, there are times in my career when I felt, gosh, you know, if only people believed in themselves, we could do twice as much. And now we are starting to believe in ourselves. Thanks, Stephen, for your answer. And thanks, Andrew, for that. It's really interesting because people often talk to me about community land ownership and what triggered um, the kind of, there's a wee bit of a domino effect of community bias in the area here and what kind of caused it. And, and I always say, what comes first, the community confidence or the community bias, and how linked are they? And, and it's a bit of a chicken and egg situation, but the community confidence definitely grows afterwards. Um, but also the community confidence, it has to be there initially, um, but it definitely does, um, does really grow. We've had a, a, a longer question in here, so I'm going to ask David Stewart to read that because I'm going to come to him next. Um, but just before that, I'm going to go to one um, earlier. I'm just going to give him a chance to read that. Um, so there was a question earlier, um, and uh, apologies, I, I, um, I'm I not 100% sure which question and who was answering when they mentioned option registers. Um, but there's a question here about controlling interests and how far you go. And it's quite a big topic and um, there's quite a bit to discuss. So I just wondered, um, I'm just going to come to David Adams and just ask if you'd be able to just share some thoughts on that kind of controlling interest. And also, um, if you're a community and you don't know who owns the land, um, you know, and how much of an issue is that still? Um, and then I'll come to Andrew and see if he's got any uh, thoughts on that as well afterwards. But I'll come to you first, David, thank you. Yeah, I mean, the options is interesting because um, most of the options are held either by big, house building companies um, such as Taylor Wimpy, Persimmon, Red Row, those kind of people, um, or by land promoters. So I don't think that we, 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 there would be a problem of secrecy actually tracing an office and a person who, who is responsible for that. Um, if there is, then the new, uh, although it's taken some time to come in, um, but there is, there is new laws and new registers on um, being able to discover exactly who is uh, the person who's controlling um, companies, even if they're sort of based in, in Jersey or the Cayman Islands or wherever. Um, so so you, you would be able to um, eventually find who it was. But I don't actually think that's a huge problem in relation to residential land, it's more of a problem, if there is one, in relation to commercial centres and places like Centre of Glasgow or Centre of Edinburgh and so on and so forth. Um, as far as finding communities, finding who um, who the owner is, I mean, the standard way of doing it is obviously going through the, uh, the land registry for Scotland or the Saisins or whatever. Um, and in many cases, that will identify uh, who is the owner. But in a small minority of cases, it, it is just unknown and no one does claim ownership. Um, and there are ways in which uh, maybe David, David Stewart wants to say a little bit more about uh, what the Commission has been doing in relation to ownership land, because I think that's, sorry, owner, owner <laughs> land that has no, or you can't find the owner, because I think we've been doing uh, various things on that and the relevance to communities, which, which might answer that question, David. Thanks, I'll come to you, David Stewart. Yeah, thanks. It's been a very 
interesting piece of work that, and um, never quite remember the name of this this organization as part of the government. It's the ALTR, which is the King's Land Treasury. But anyway, they're they're quite a small organization, and actually through work that my colleague James McKessick Leach has has done. They've expanded their work and now they're actually doing um, quite significant work where there's own ownerless land, where they're willing to investigate it, sometimes take it on, but also facilitate transfers to uh, an interested community. And there's actually, we, we've been running a, a series of land at lunch events that provides information to the public on, on different aspects of our work. And um if you get a chance, and this will go into much more detail and be um, much more articulate and erudite about the process, but there's actually a a 45 minute seminar discussing the the work that they do and how it can actually solve problems with with land that's been neglected where you can't find owner and actually turn that around to a positive use and very often community ownership. Thanks, David. And I would just like to, to point out that before Christmas, I was asked to go on the radio and talk about this topic. So if anyone has the Gaelic translation of Kings and Lords Treasurers, I'd, I'd love to hear it because I had to just do it in English because I didn't know the Gaelic translation of that. So so I was definitely out of my depth today. I had to talk about that. But thanks again to David Stewart because he did uh, brief me very well before that. Um, Andrew, did you want to come in on that at all? Hey, I, love, I love your Gaelic for that. Um, the, the, I just want to respond to Helen's point because she's making quite an important point that if you if something is brownfield, how, how you know how do you how how do you then start moving it moving it towards being you know a national nature reserve or a European designated SAC or whatever? And I think it's a really um, of course she's right that if 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 we take an old coal bin and we turn it into a wonderful nature reserve, then it's a nature reserve. It's not a coal bin. It's not a brownfield site. It's a nature reserve. Um, and there needs to be a way of doing it, and there is. And I, when I was doing the canals job, we were very, very closely involved in the development of Hamilton Claypix local nature reserve, which is a brownfield post-industrial site on the north side of the canal in North Glasgow, and which is now, um, I mean, it's still forming, but is now forming as a local nature reserve. It's got deer, it's got kingfishers, it's got all sorts of stuff in it. And, it's de and, and in conjunction with Glasgow City Council, who are a great authority, uh, it's now designated local nature reserve. And it'll be interesting to see where, where the community take it. The community have driven that from the start. But crucially, and I think it, it does, and I, I, you know, I don't know enough, I think, about West Lothian, so forgive me, but there is something here about the way in which community uh, organisations, whether it's Civic Trust, Venture, venture um, uh, uh, sorry, not venture, but, um, development trusts or whatever. So there's something there about the way they harness initiative, but they also collaborate with local government and don't get into a, a standoff with local government, which can be very dis destructive. But there is absolutely no reason, Helen, why you shouldn't take whatever it is that you've done on the rewilding site and say, right, this is important enough to us to have it designated designated local nature reserve and then take it from there and see where it goes absolutely no reason at all why not and it's it's great to see that actually that's you know for for, for me this this is this is what what localism and community empowerment will will do that people will say well actually you may think that 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 bing should be used for housing or whatever but we think it should be used for this and that's what we're going to do thanks Andrew. um and Andrew was also the previously the change of nature scholar, so he's got some some other sort of relevant knowledge with this as well. And I'm going to come to David Stewart with this question, but I just I um, I absolutely loved reading this, and I and I just want to say here we're so far ahead of your time to be doing rewilding in 2003, you know. So uh, so you're definitely ahead of your time. Uh, so uh, David Stewart, did you want to come back on this one as well? Did you want to have a response on this? Yeah, I, I think it's a great question, and. Um... I'm certainly aware of one project in West Lothian that, that took Brownfield land at Winchborough and then it's redeveloped it for a mixture of, of 
housing, but also uh, created a public park and a new schools. But um, local authorities provide a, a return, a, a vacant and derelict land register every year. So there should be that that change from um, it being vacant land and, and brownfield land to a, a recorded new use. But yeah, I think it's a very good um, question about then how you protect or make sure that there's enough land for these other uses when housing land has such a, a high value. And, and I think really community empowerment, as Andrew talked about, was, was key in it. And maybe just mentioned here that there's been quite a lot of talk about housing development it's quite emotive um we published a, a report on the the value of early engagement and planning maybe about two years ago that made a, a strong case to developers that actually if they really engage with communities that are not in a lip service way but really get in early and listen actually it benefits everyone you get better developments and better places and you're more more likely to get support for development. And that, that's a case we continue to make to the house building industry. Thanks, David. That's great. And thanks, Andrew. And I'm going to come to Andrew now. Um, and just on the, um, as David spoke there, it really kind of got me thinking about um, if you have queries like this, um, can you come to the Land Commission? Can we signpost you as a community if you're not quite sure about the rights and the responsibilities of a landowner? Um, what can we do to help you? Um, we can't get involved in everything because we're a very small team, but we can usually signpost to the right place and sometimes we can get involved. So I want to ask Andrew to just expand a little bit on the land rights and responsibilities work we did that he touched on in his talk and then a little bit about our good practice team um, and just to sort of encourage you all to get in touch when you have specifics like that. So we've, I mean, we are a very wee organisation, and I think it's important to be, you know, to be honest about the, lim the you know, the limits to what we can do. We're fundamentally here to to advise Parliament and government on on, on on land reform, but we we took a very deliberate decision to put a chunk of our resource into. Um, what Sally refers to as good practice, but essentially what I like to characterize as spelling out what responsible looks like. Um, because, you know, Parliament said with land rights go responsibilities, but no one said what responsible means. So, so we took it on ourselves to try and do that. So all these protocols, and there's a small team behind them, are attempting to do that. And um, Within that sort of raft of, of stuff is, is, is quite a lot of information about um, how communities should go about getting in, engaged in land use decision making and how landowners of whatever kind, public, private, third sector, how they should respond. It's, it, it's, it's, it's spelled out there, it's the script. And you know, I, I see at least one land agent on this call who, um, who's, a, who's a big player in West, West, West Lothian. Um, and it is really important that people who own land in these areas also engage with 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 these protocols and and the team. I put up at the end of my wee presentation an email address, and I'll put it back up again, or maybe maybe just put it into the chat. Um, but please, if, if you're in any doubt about any of this, please email us and ask, and we will do our level best to help. Um, you know, we may not be able to hold your hand the whole way, but we can certainly signpost. So, so you know, don't hesitate to ask. I think it's probably the most useful message, Sally, actually. Thanks very much. And there's another question that's come in, Andrew. Um, so, and I think it's as you were speaking, it came in. So it's as you were speaking about the land rights and responsibilities. And it's just asking that question, which we often get asked, and which I think links to, uh, you know, the changes that may or may not be coming about what teeth does the Scottish Land Commission have? So if you just want to expand a wee bit on the difference with the Tenant Farming Commissioner there. Yeah, so, um, so I actually chaired the review of Tenant Farming in 2014 that led to the Tenant Farming Commissioner. And, and, and what we said at the time, there was tremendous, I mean, ministers and, and the MSPs were just getting utterly dismayed by the amount of squabbling and disagreement that was going on between landowners and tenants and land agents and tenants. And they set this up and they said, you know, come up with some recommendations to fix this. 
And essentially what they were looking for was to stop this squabbling and stop this bullying and stop this nonsense and get into a more collaborative space. So we said, well, actually, it would be pretty helpful if you had someone who could bang heads together. So that's the Tenant Farming Commission. Um, and it would be pretty helpful if Parliament gave her or him, as it turned out to be a him, but but, but um, I suspect it, that it will probably be a, a, a lady next time round. I don't know. Um, that person, she, he, um, could, had some legal underpinning for putting in place codes of practice that, that, that basically say, you know, for example, if you're going to do a rent review, there needs to be a fair process. It was one of the most contentious areas we dealt with. It needs to be a fair. So we put in place a code. Now, that's all worked really well. And politicians tell me that, that they get very, very little now in the way of uh, constituents coming and saying, look, I've been bullied by my landowner, I've been bullied by a land agent, or indeed landowners coming and saying, I've been bullied by my tenants, which has also happened, I should say. And I've seen some pretty awful behaviour by tenants too. That's by and large not happening now. So what government is now saying, is look, that's that's worked. And meantime, the Land Commission has been established and has produced all these protocols. Well, actually, would it make sense, perhaps particularly for big land, if those protocols were given a bit of statutory underpinning? And if they were, what would that look like? So that was in the consultation. Now, I don't know what's going to be in the bill when it's published, but my guess is it'll be something like, um, I think they will say for big landowners over a certain area, these protocols will become mandatory and there will be a mechanism whereby if, if um, certain parties, and it might be elected representatives or community councils or whatever, believe that a landowner is not following those protocols, they can lodge a complaint with evidence, it can be investigated, and if, 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 they, if, if, if the evidence is up, upholds the complaint, then uh, the landowner will be found in, in default. And that will matter, not so much, I, I don't believe there will be big fines or, or big sticks, and most of these people are pretty wealthy and will not be worried about it. It'll matter because reputationally, it'll be extremely damaging to be found up for call in, in, in the court of public opinion. But more importantly, it will then start to put questions over whether when it comes to the public interest test, when this land holding next changes hands, there will be questions over whether it is wise to have so much power in one, one set of hands. So I, 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 am, I am very optimistic, but I don't know what it's going to look like yet. Sorry, thanks, Andrew. Um, I, we're just going to come wrapping up now. We're just coming to the end. So thank you very much for that, Andrew, because I think it's a really important point to, to, um, to talk about these kind of where we are now and where we're changing to and, and the kind of legislation around that. There's a question here about the kind of health um, health benefits. And um, it, it's something that is in, is in a lot of work we do. So we're looking at not just that financial value, but the other values of land. And that's included in things like community wealth building. But there is also a blog that came out in 2021 that was done by a researcher that looked at the links between community land ownership and health benefits, which is actually really interesting to read. So I'm just going to pop up a wee link to that there. Um, and, uh, and I remember being involved in that um, when he was doing his research, and it is actually really interesting um, what came out of it. So that's well well worth a wee read. Um, so just to wrap up, I'm going to go to just one last question, um, which I think we haven't answered, and I'm going to go to David Adams with this. And this is um, this is about the balance of revenue. So you feel like the landowner wants to gain just financial gain from it um, and but but as a community you might have something else that you feel is a, a different non-revenue and um, so I mean I guess I guess leisure reserves don't need to be non-revenue generating would be one thing but it's a different value and it links back to loads of the comments we've had tonight so I just want to offer David the kind of final thought for this evening as we reflect on that question so over to you David Adams. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Sally. Uh, th this is a real conundrum because um, land has all kinds of values depending on what it's used for. And uh, there's pressure to use it for high value 
um, uses both from landowners and, and, and from councils. I think what I'd say on that is the sooner uh, a community gets in with their ideas and gets into the decision-making processes, the more the, the better the chances of success. And that if the community's views are expressed right at the end of the process, when landowner and local authorities have made the decisions, it, it, it's really, really quite hard. Uh, my own experience is um, just to try and um, see what councils involve. They not only involve um, officers and council officers, they actually involve your elected politicians. And my own experience would be um, try, and, try and make early contact with your councillor or your councillors um, right at the start of the process and get them on your side uh, and, and, and don't leave it too late because uh, if, if it's left too late and decisions have already been made, then it becomes really, really hard to reverse those decisions. Thanks very much, David, and, and that's a really good point to finish on. Um, I'm going to wrap up now. Um, I'm going to say a big, big thank you to Jess in the background. And Jess has just um, provided information in the chat and where you can get a list of the links and how to do it. Um, there's loads of information in those, uh, in those links, so please do email us if you'd like a list of them. Uh, thank you very, very much to the panel. Um, thank you to my fellow commissioners, Andrew and David, for joining us. And very, very big thank you to David Stewart for giving up his evening and coming to join us uh, and sharing his wealth of knowledge with us. And, uh, and most importantly, thank you so much to all of you uh, for joining us this evening. It's been really lively, really interesting discussion. I, uh, I, thoroughly, uh, I thoroughly enjoy these sessions and I just want to say thank you. And finally, please, please um, fill out our survey so we can find out how to make these better. And, um, and I think it's certainly going to go on my bucket list um, to visit your, your nature reserve. So I look forward to seeing some of you there. So thank you very much to everyone for, the, for this evening and uh, look forward to seeing you all soon. Thanks very much. Good night. Thanks. Bye.